let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you and we praise you for all things. We thank you for the day and every blessing you've given us, love, grace, and mercy you've shown towards us. We thank you for your word tonight, for your word is record of your thoughts towards us. Those are thoughts of peace and not of evil to give us a future and a hope. Uh, you have said that your word shall not return unto you void because you watch over it and what you uh, have sent it to do, what your mind has designed, your heart desires, it shall come to pass. It will accomplish all that you sent it forth to do. And so, Father, we thank you for your word and we ask that you would let revelation knowledge flow. Please, sir, share your heart and reveal your mind any way you bless us. We'll be satisfied. Thank you for your precious people that you have provided me this opportunity to share from your word with your sons, your daughters in your kingdom. Those who seek your kingdom, your way of doing things and your righteousness, the way of being. Thank you for them. And tonight, Father, I pray that for their benefit and for mine, for our benefit, that you would let revelation knowledge flow. Share your heart. Reveal your mind. Hallelujah. God, anoint my mind that I might think your thoughts, my mouth that I might speak your word, my body that I might do your will. Anoint your people with ears to hear, hearts to receive, minds to understand, and a will to apply what your word instructs. Now, Father, we thank you and we say have your way in this time of sharing. It's in the name of Jesus we pray and we boldly declare uh, that the devil is defeated. God, you're exhausted. Jesus, your Lord, and I will agree with the prayer of the man of God. Shout out hallelujah. Amen and thank you, Jesus. Well, come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise uh, right there in the chat. If you're ready for God's word, if you're excited about God's word, if you, uh, if you love God's word, uh, give God glory, honor, and praise. Come on, let me see. Give me some hearts. That's right. Give me some thumbs up. Let me see if you're engaged. Minister Teresa Johnson, good to see you. Samir Williams Pender, good to see you. Hey, Renee Howard, good to see you. Elder Mary Tao, good to see you. Latanya McCall, hello, hello, hello. A lot of that, everybody. Hey, Sharika Wilson, good to see you. Tamika McElwain, good to see you. Come on in the house. Come on in the room. You don't want to miss tonight's teaching. You are in the right place at the right time. Hallelujah. Justina Howes. Hello, 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 hello. I see you engaged. I see you. I see you. Thank you, people of God. Vera Adams. Good to see you. Sandra Young Sanders. Hey, classmate. Good to see you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, come on. Uh, Gogi Turner. Good to see you. Mother Irish Greer. Good to see you. The mother's been checking in. We thank God for each and every one of our mothers. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Rhonda Nixon, thank you for being here. Hallelujah. Speaking of our mothers, we are thanking God for uh, him bringing Minister Willie Mae Neal thank, uh, safely and uh, in a healthy manner through her procedure. And we're grateful and thankful for her. Thank you for each and everybody. The Lord is doing a great thing. Brother Stan Abraham is on the men. We're grateful and thankful for him. Listen, TCI, join me uh, uh, in continual and consistent prayer uh, for Brother uh, Thomas Anderson. Brother Thomas Anderson, uh, our, uh, our former guitar player, uh, his mother transitioned. And so we're praying for him uh, and his lovely wife, Sasha, uh, as they uh, and the rest of the family as they are uh, in a place that so many of us have been uh, and so many of us are uh, the transition of a loved one in particular a mother we're lifting uh, them up and uh, if you have their information uh, reach out to them let them know that you're praying for them let them know that you're thinking about them let you let them know that you care all right let's get into the word I said a whole lot earlier, so I'm just going to jump right into our teaching. Uh, and, and we're talking about life in the kingdom in 2024. But uh, this teaching, of course, uh, is in honor, in commemoration, in celebration. But watch this again. In explanation of what this season, this coming celebration called Pentecost means. Uh, of course, Jesus says in Luke chapter number 24, uh, that I'm getting ready uh, to send the promise uh, that I've mentioned to you 
uh, many times before. We we talked last week about how you know John fourteen, John uh, John six sixteen fifteen sixteen. Jesus talks about uh, the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and in Luke chapter number 24, this is post Jesus's resurrection. He says, y'all go to the city of Jerusalem. This is, you know, this is after they've seen that he's alive. They've seen, uh, they've seen the, the nail prints in his hand. They've seen, uh, the, the, the spear, uh, print in his side. They see, uh, the indentations and the imprintations of the crown of thorns on his brow. They see all of this. And he says, I made it through that. I, I made it through, I made it through the season of offenses, multiple offenses, right? He shows them that he made it through. And he said, I need y'all based upon what I've shown you, based upon my re Resurrection. I need y'all to go tell the story. I need y'all to go preach the gospel. Here it is again. And preach the gospel and its thesis, its main thought, its thematic thrust. And, and that is, watch this. Yes, the forgiveness of sin or the remission of sin in my name. But he says, I need you to preach the gospel. And I need you to, to preach it knowing that the, the essence of the gospel is the love of God that is extended through me to mankind, right? But not just that. The gospel is the love of God that Jesus chooses to embrace that Jews, Jesus chooses to extend. And he extends this love of God. Y'all got to catch this. Through forgiveness. Remember we said that forgiveness is the greatest expression of love. Are y'all listening to me? Belinda Berry, hey sis. So good to see you. Betty Lee, good to see you. Prophetess Karen Geiger, good to see you. That forgiveness is the greatest expression of love. That's why he says, go preach the remission of sin in my name. Right? He says, but you can't go do it now. <laughs> you have to wait for the promise of the Father. What is the promise of the Father? We know that to be what Jesus talks about in John 14, 15, and 16. The promise of the Father is the Holy Spirit. So when we look at John chapter number 20, in John chapter number 20, John speaks of, elaborates on um, the same thing that Luke does in John 24. I mean, I'm sorry, in Luke 24, but John fills in some gaps. Whereas in Luke 24, and you've, if you've been with me for a while, you, you, you know, you've heard this before. If not, uh, just check it out. Luke 24, uh, in, in Luke 24, the latter part of that, uh, uh, the Bible says Jesus comes, shows his hand, shows his side. And they're really excited and ecstatic to see him, but they don't believe it's him. They think it's a ghost. So Jesus says, give me some fish. Uh, and Jesus eats a piece of fish and shows them that he is literally, he's not a ghost. He is... He is alive, that he has made it through the brutal treatment that he incurred at Calvary, right? And so the Bible says, you know, that they're behind closed doors because they're fearful that the people who were the enemies of Jesus, who by virtue of their association to Jesus, are their enemies as well, who seek to do to them what they did to Jesus, right? They're fearful. Jesus has to show them that he made it through all of this. And he said, I need you to preach forgiveness. Remission of sin, preach forgiveness. He said, but you got to wait to be endued and endowed with power from on high. In John 20, the Bible says when he steps in, he, he says peace to them. He says peace to them 
you know, shows them his hand, shows them his side. And then he says, uh, peace to them again. And he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. So John 20, verse 21. And the Bible says that after he breathed on the 11, the Holy Spirit, he says to them, catch this, y'all. He says to them, receive ye the Holy Spirit. And then he says, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. And whoever sins you retain, they are retained. Right? Jesus says that the primary function of the Holy Spirit, now he has, you know, we talked about his, we talked about his other, you know, functions. I call them manifestations, but they're really functions. He has quite a few functions, but, you know, one, he's an advocate, which means he, he speaks on our behalf in the language of God, in the language that God understands. He speaks on our behalf. Uh, number two, he is the, the comforter. So he comforts us. He aids us. Um, he soothes us um, for the sake of this conversation and the sake of this teaching. He soothes us. He soothes the pain that comes from being offended, right? But he's also the helper. He helps us to do whatever God has commanded us to do. And again, for the sake of tonight's conversation, the Holy Spirit helps us to forgive. I said all that to say that once again, the primary function of the Holy Spirit According to Jesus, I gave, I gave them to the 11 so they can, yes, preach forgiveness of sin, but so that they can forgive sin, so they can forgive offense. So you can't, you can preach it, but remember, it is not effective if you don't live it. I didn't mean to say all this tonight. Here it is again. We can preach forgiveness. We can have head knowledge of forgiveness. And, that you know, we can have head knowledge of the fact that forgiveness is the greatest expression of love. And we can have head knowledge of the fact that if we don't forgive others, then, then, then we will be held captive to our sin, our failure, our shortcoming. We can have head knowledge of all of that. We can know everything that the Bible says about forgiveness. But if we preach it and don't live it, Sharika Mick, good to see you. If we preach it and we don't live it, we have a form of godliness, but we deny the power. We operate. If we say it but don't do it, more important. If we say it but we don't be it, but we don't embody it, then according to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, we are a sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. Um, you know, we are workers of iniquity. If we give our bodies to be burned at the stake, but have not love, we ain't doing nothing. So if we talk about it, but we don't do it, then we ain't saying nothing. We ain't doing nothing. And Paul says, lastly, you know, that if you understand all prophecies and mysteries and all that kind of stuff, and you have like, have not love, you ain't nothing. Are you listening to me? That is why this discussion about the Holy Spirit and him being the power to forgive is so important. Because anything you do that is not a, from a place of love, agape, not eros. Eros is sensual love. It ain't, sensual ain't sexual. Sensual is, you know, it's what I ascertain with my senses. So it's, you know, if it's sensual, if my love is sensual, 
I love I, I do it because I feel good about it. Or because it makes me feel good and I know the reward from it, I'll do it. But it's not sensual. So it's not, it's not eros. It's it's not filial. You know, filial, filial is brotherly love. Where there is brotherly love, there has to be some sort of, of affinity. It is not stergno, S-T-E-R-G-N-O. That's familial love. I love you based upon the fact that you're my family. Our, your, our, we have the same blood running warm in our veins. It is not libido. Libido, whereas eros is a uh, sensual love. Libido is sexual love. So I don't just, you know, I don't just love you because you are my spouse or you are who I am in an intimate re physical relationship with, you know, and the emotions that come with it. No, it is the agape love. It, it is it is the love that seeks the greater good of the one that is loved. Watch this. Even if the one that is loved does not seek my greater good. I didn't mean to go this deep into the explanation, but I, I, that's why this is so important. Minister Tammy Williams, so good to see you. Mary McCain, good to see you. This is so serious. This is so serious. This is so serious. We can't bypass it. It is absolutely amazing that some of Jesus' shortest statements are the most profound statements. And one of Jesus' short statements that is greatly profound is this. If you don't forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive you. Unforgiveness ties God's hand and shackles God's hand so that whatever power that needs to be broken off of your life, he is prohibited from doing it because you won't forgive. Jada Don, good to see you. I didn't mean to lay this on this heavy tonight. I promise you I didn't. And if we don't want it, seriously, I'm dead serious. If you don't want to be challenged tonight, hastily prepare it. If you don't want to be challenged tonight, sign off because this is going to be, this is going to be, this is going to be extremely challenging. And, um, and Solomon says, Knowledge is a burden, which means that if I know it, I am literally responsible for the application of it. Right? Because remember what the word of God says again. That if I know what to do and I don't do it, to me, it is sin. I'm, I'm dead serious. If we don't want to be challenged, I would. I am inviting you to log off, and I am uh, advising you not to watch this teaching, because once you hear it, you are responsible for it. So last week. We talked about the fact that forgiveness has no limits. It has no limits. God can forgive anybody. He will forgive anybody and forgive anything. And we must be willing to do the same. Y'all still with me? You still got time to sign off. Because forgiveness has no limits. Jesus says, when asked by, you know, by Peter and, and the other apostles, um, um, how many times should we forgive? Because Jesus had just told him, listen, 
Offenses must come and you must forgive. They say, well, this is a hard thing. Do you say, if, if, they, if they sin against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. If they sin against you seven times, they repent seven times, forgive them. Well, Lord, how much, how, how long much we, must we do this? How many times must we do this? Seven times? Nope. 70 times, seven, 490 times. And Jesus says 490 times, not to say that that is the limit of 700, uh, I mean, um, 490 times uh, is a perfect number. 70 times seven, seven and 70 are perfect numbers. And he's saying you are to forgive until you have perfected the art of forgiveness. Y'all can still log off. Jesus wants us to forgive completely. And according to last week's teaching and according to the, the introduction tonight, check this out. We can only walk in that kind of forgiveness by yielding to the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus steps in the room, breathes on them in John chapter 20. Say, you know, first of all, he says, you know, peace. Shows them his hands, shows them the feet. You know, shows them his hands and his prints and all that kind of stuff where he's been wounded. Shows them his wound. I've made it through. I'm still, listen, I am. I made it through, but I'm still wounded. Those wounds were open. They, they weren't scars. They were wounds. I've made it through. And what I went through, what they did to me, wounded me. But remember, the gospel is the remission of sins in my name. So I am not waiting to be healed to forgive. As an act of my will and as a volitional choice, with my wound still open, I forgive. Are you hearing me? Are y'all listening? Keisha Johnson, hey, good to see you. And he says, the only way, the only way you can walk in the level of forgiveness that is required of you, you must yield to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You can't do it intellectually. Mayor Roberson, good to see you. Mother Mary Sanders, good to see you. Mother Thelma Lowe, Mother Liz, good to see you. You can't get over it. You can't even get by it or get past it. This deep kind of offense, you can't get by it or get past it without the Holy Spirit. So how do we yield to the Holy Spirit? We spend time with God. We start our day in his presence. Right? We spend time asking the Holy Spirit to do his work in us. We spend time, first of all, we spend time, you know, hearing anything he has to say to us. But before we pray, we ought to just sit silently. And then after we pray, Habakkuk tells us that we ought to we ought to wait to see what he answers. But in but in the morning, I am sitting and I'm asking, I'm, I'm spending time with the Holy Spirit. I'm asking the Holy Spirit to tell me what the agenda of the Father is. And in that, 
He is searching me and showing me not only the will of God, but he's showing me areas that I need to work on, showing me what he wants me to do. I spend time in his presence at the top of the day. The Bible tells me that I must be filled with the spirit. I must be filled with the spirit so that I don't uh, fulfill the lust of the flesh. And one of the thing, things that the flesh lust for is revenge. The flesh lust for vindication. The, 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 the flesh lust for get back and pay back. The flesh lusts to see those who have wronged us and who have offended us pay for what they've done. Let me show y'all how deep this is. James chapter number four. James chapter number four. Because you know what? Lust is not just a desire. Lust is a craving. It is an almost insatiable craving. In other words, I'm craving something that even if I get it, I still won't be satisfied. So the Bible says, let, 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 let me show you how this. Y'all okay? Y'all can y'all 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 can jump off because I'm getting ready to tell you something that the Holy Ghost dropped on me today, and it's gonna help some of y'all. Hear what the word of God says. Um, in Galatians chapter number five, Galatians chapter number five, this ain't in my notes, but he, 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 remember, remember, I just told you that the word of God says, walk in the spirit and and if you do so, you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And I said, one of the things that the spirit lust is revenge. Or not the spirit, the flesh craves lust revenge. So I want you to look at Galatians chapter five. Galatians chapter number five. I, I'm... I'm getting ready to give you context and explanation for why you're wrestling so with an with 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 the offense or the offenses. So Galatians chapter number five, verse number thirteen. This ain't in my notes, but I need y'all to hear this. Galatians five, verse number thirteen says. You, my brother and sisters, were called to be free. I could do a whole, I could do a whole sermon on that. Because forgiveness is setting a, a prisoner free, and the prisoner is you. So he says in Galatians 5, verse 13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out. You will be destroyed by each other. <laughs> right? It is a vicious cycle. So if you do something to me and I do something to you and my primary focus, my sole objective is to get you back and make you pay. Galatians, I, I'm telling y'all, this wasn't in my notes in the beginning. But if my sole objective and if my goal is to make you pay for it, The scriptures say, not me, the scriptures say, if I bite, if you bite and devour each other, watch out, you will be destroyed by each other. If you keep trying to get them back. 
You might destroy them, but you're going to be destroyed. Hey, Shirley Nance, good to see you. Mother Josephine Burgess Haywood, good to see you. Mildred Kimberly Don Lee, good to see you. This is going to get crazier, y'all. So again, you can log off at any time because knowledge is a burden. Timothy Trussell, good to see you, son. Shirley Nance, hello. Are you hearing me? It is a vicious and endless cycle. Y'all going to kill. You going to kill them. You going to kill yourself trying to kill them. Nelson Mandela said forgiveness unforgiveness is just like poison it's like drinking poison and expecting the person that offended you to die it's a vicious cycle so here's what he says in verse number 16 so i say walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. So the only way for the sake of this discussion to forgive in the way and on the level that God desires for us to forgive is to, is to yield, hallelujah, to yield to the Holy Spirit. Because the flesh craves revenge. And the flesh ain't just your body, you know. We, you know, we talk about we, you know, we talk about lust, oftentimes, you know, we talk about sex and we talk about money and we talk about power. And I'm not discounting or dismissing those things. All of those, all of those are facilitators of lust. Yes, they are. But the flesh or the carnal nature the mind that is at enmity with God, the mind that is opposed to the things of God, it lusts other, it lusts things that are not sex, that are not money, that are not power, but are still in opposition to God's word. And one of those things is revenge. And revenge is birthed out of unforgiveness. Well, Tamiko McElwain, that was a great question. First of all, the first point was, if you are going to forgive completely, you got to walk in forgiveness by yielding to the Holy Spirit. You got to yield to the Holy Spirit. I don't, you can go back and watch last week when I talked about how you know, forgiveness is, you know, the root word is give. And whenever you give something, you're releasing it. So it is a root word, but it has a prefix for. And the prefix for, F-O-R, means before or ahead of. So forgiveness is really choosing to forgive before the offense happens, right? So that's why I'm being filled with the spirit in the morning, because I know offense. Jesus has said offenses must come. Right. So I'm being I'm, I'm being filled with the spirit. I'm sitting in the presence of the spirit because offenses, Jesus said, must come. And let me say this. Not only must they come, but I know that the enemy is going to bring past offenses up again. So before the enemy brings up past offenses, I make up in my mind, even though this is not an intellectual function, I make up in my mind to yield to the ministry of the Holy Spirit and to say, if the enemy brings up that offense from the past, even if 
<laughs> oh, God have mercy. If the enemy brings up the offense from the past, even in cases where the offense is ongoing, where the person is, is continuing in that way, they keep doing it. My coworker keeps doing it. My, 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 my enemy, uh, you know, in the city keeps doing it, keeps saying it. I make up in my mind that even if the offense keeps coming up in my mind or coming up in my reality, Holy Spirit, I submit to you. Because it is you and you alone who can help aid and assist me in obeying the gospel. Turn to James chapter 4 real fast. I want to show you this. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop on you what I got to say. Again, you got time to log off. <laughs> And I'm saying it comically, but I'm not saying it jokingly. This is a heavy teaching. This is a heavy word. It's a heavy responsibility. It's a heavy weight. And again, if you know it, you are responsible for it. And the Holy Spirit was ministering that to me today. And I'm going to give you some insights to help you. Um, James, chapter number four. James, chapter number four, verse number five. Now, remember we said that, that the flesh, for the sake of this discussion, the flesh craves, the, the, the flesh lusts. For revenge. Lust for payback. Lust for get back. And I'm talking about. Un <laughs> We're going to deal with this tonight. Underneath. Like underneath. You know that. That super spiritual countenance. And behind that, um, that um, fake smile, it looks real, but that thing, that, that carnal nature wants them to pay for what they did. But look at James chapter number four. I'll start at verse number one. Ain't none of this in my notes. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So let's back up. So let's Let's, let's, let's insert the word um, revenge, get back, pay back, whatever it is. Let, let's insert that in certain places. So here it is. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires or your, your lust that battle within you? You, des you desire or you lust but you do not have, you desire or you lust for revenge, but you do not have. You covet what you cannot get. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, <laughs> right? So you want them to pay like somebody else paid who did somebody else the way they did you. So you covet that, but you can't get what you want. So, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Watch this. Next verse says, and sometimes you ask, but you ask, but you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives. 
God ain't never going to get them because you haven't forgiven them. God's never going to do it for you. He's never, he's never going to, he's never going to move off of his place of godness. No, that's the word, but it, it's tonight. He's never going to mutate his character. God is love, unconditional love. God is forgiveness. So he's never going to deal with them in the way that you want him to deal with them because you want him to deal with them that way. He's not going to do it because if he do it to them, he got to do it to you too. He said, so, you know, you ask, but you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. So you want God to get them so you can be satisfied with the fact that they paying for what they did, did to you. I don't even, I don't even, I don't even want to go that to me, McElwain, because asking in Jesus' name ain't just saying in the name of Jesus. Asking in Jesus' name means asking in the way and in the spirit that Jesus would ask. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 5 says this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, right? So it, it is the attitude and the disposition of Jesus. So the question has to be asked, would Jesus ask God to get anybody? And the truth of the matter is, the answer would be no, because he just told them in Luke 24 to go preach for the forgiveness of sin in his name. Go preach to the very people who have who, who offended me and who and who are out to get you. So asking in Jesus' name is just not ending the prayer in the name of Jesus. It is asking in the way and with the mindset that Jesus would ask. In the spirit that Jesus would ask. Whatever you ask in my name, whatever you ask in my spirit, whatever you ask in my authority, whatever you ask with my motives in mind, it'll happen. Thank you for bringing it up. James chapter four, verse number four says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Stop there. He says, you adulterous people, but he's talking about spiritual adultery. That ain't, ex it just ain't excusing natural adultery. It's not excusing it. But in this instance, Jesus is talking about spiritual adultery. What is spiritual adultery? Wanting to, wanting, wanting to have, wanting to be right with God and right with the devil. Wanting, wanting to be free from whatever it is, but still holding unforgiveness in your heart. And the Bible says that friendship with the world means you're an enemy with God. So if you want somebody if you if you want get back, if you want payback, if you want um, if you want revenge, right? There is no way you can want what God wants to. I told y'all you can sign off because it's getting deeper. It's getting heavier. So if you choose to be a listen, if you choose. To want revenge, won't get back. Mother Bertha Adams, good to see you. If you if you choose to want them to be harmed and to pay for, for that, I didn't make this up. If you choose that, you become an enemy of God. My refusal to forgive makes me an enemy of God. Why? Because the goal, the objective, and even the essence of God is love, and the greatest expression of love is forgiveness.
If that ain't enough, look at verse number five. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? King James Version says that the spirit lusteth to envy. So now we don't just see the carnal nature lusting. We see, we see that the spirit of God lust. What is lust? Lust is an insatiable desire. It is, it, you can never forgive enough. The spirit, <laughs> here's what it says, y'all. He said, the spirit jealously longs. He, this, listen, whenever you, um, Whenever you choose not to forgive, watch this, having the spirit of God who enables you to forgive, whenever you choose not to do that, you put the Holy, you, the Holy Spirit envies, hear me, the Holy Spirit envies whoever controls you. And don't tell me that God don't envy. God, when God brings Israel out of Egypt, the first commandment, check it out. It is six verses long. And God is saying, listen, I'm jealous. You can have no other God besides me. Are you listening? In Exodus 34, he says, Know this, that the Lord your God is a jealous God, and my name is jealous. And God says, I ain't jealous of you. I ain't even, I listen, I ain't even jealous of the end. I'm jealous for you. I did all this for you to get you free. And you are letting somebody else have power in your life. Who wants to keep you in bondage? It's right here in the scripture. So watch this. And then I'm going to drop something else on you and we're going to go. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, watch this. And I'm still talking about forgiveness. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. You still got time to sign off. I'm going to tell you why I said that in a minute. First Thessalonians chapter number five. Woo. Now watch this y'all. Um, Just, just bear with me for a minute. Indulge me. By way of textual survey explanation um, of what the theme of 2 Thessalonians is, I would have you to know that Paul is writing to this church and to let them know that even though people say that Jesus ain't coming back, that the, that, that the, that the, that the resurrection has already happened, you know, no, he he's he's coming back and he's not slack. Right? He's not slack, the word says, concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but he's long suffering, not whether that anyone should perish, but the all should come to rent. He is giving us time to get ourselves together. And so here's what he's saying. The church at Thess Thessalonica, Christians all over the world were going through great persecution during that time. And the persecution was unrelenting. Hardship just because they were believers. I'm trying to help y'all tonight. So he's saying to them, nope, 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 nope. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. To whatever he's told you to do. Right? 
I know it don't look like it. I know we've been saying this all the time. You know, he's coming back. I know it don't look. I know it's. I know it's getting worse. I know he. Paul tells Timothy, wicked and evil men are growing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I know it is an age of deception. I know it is an age wherein people think that they are right in 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 their activity, holding grudges, or betraying or doing any of that kind of stuff. And oftentimes they'll do it in the name of God. Hey, Mother Killings, good to see you. Mother Mary McCain, God bless you. Good to see you. All this in what Paul, Paul told Timothy in, you know, in, in 2 Timothy about the last days and Jesus talks about in Matthew 24 and all that. So the church of Thessalonica, that's what they're going through. People are, people are wilding. People are, people People are lovers of themselves, love more than lovers of God. They love pleasures. You know, they, they are unthankful. They're unholy. They're truce breakers. They're all of this kind of stuff. That's what's happening. So in, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, outside of verse number 12 for the sake of context, Paul says, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. This is what we're doing tonight, hopefully. Make sure that nobody, hear this, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Look at verse 16. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Here is the punchline. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them and hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. Here's what he said. Remember, don't quench the Holy Spirit. If you quench him, what, what, what does quench mean? To quench literally means to, to um, snuff out his power, to resist his power. If you if, if you quench him, you're going to grieve him. Why are you grieving him? Because remember, he's jealous. That's how serious this is. And what does he say in verse number 15? Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong but always strive to do what is good for each other. Well, who enables us to do this? The Holy Spirit that we're told not to quench. The Holy Spirit that we're told not to grieve. You may sign off now because it gets heavier. Listen, I told y'all a while ago, told y'all a while ago, that God will anoint people to offend you, right? To anoint means to choose, but it also means to empower. It happens in the book of Exodus. It's about in Exodus chapter number four. I want you to see this. You've heard me say this before. I'm going somewhere with this. I'm getting ready to help you. I'm getting ready to answer a question that you've had for so long. Exodus. Turn there. Exodus 
Exodus, let's go to Exodus chapter number nine. Exodus chapter number nine. Exodus seven, then Exodus nine. Exodus chapter seven, then Exodus chapter nine. Exodus chapter seven. Exodus chapter seven, verse number three. I'll start at verse number one. I'll start at verse number one. God is dealing with Moses about his assignment to go to Israel. So Exodus chapter seven, verse number one. I'm going to have y'all off of here by nine o'clock tonight or even before, hopefully. Listen to this. Exodus seven, verse number one. Then the Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you like God. I've made you like God to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. Verse three, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. We ain't even got to go to chapter number nine, chapter number 10, but you know, just to show you how deep this thing of unforgiveness or forgiveness is and God's requirement of it and how, you know, God will anoint people to offend you. Exodus chapter number nine. I won't read the other stuff. Exodus chapter nine. Because I, I, want, I, want, I want to get out of here. But it, I'm, I'm just trying to prove a point to you. Exodus chapter nine. Let me start at verse number eight. I'll read very quickly. Exodus nine, verse number eight. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of soot from the furnace and have Moses toss it into the air in the presence of Pharaoh. It will become fine dust over the whole land of Egypt and festering boils will break out on the people and the animals throughout the land. So they took soot from the furnace and stood before Pharaoh. Moses tossed it into the air and the festering boils broke out on the people and the animals. The, the magicians could not stand before Moses because the boils that were on them, uh, because of the boils that were on them and all of the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron just as the Lord had said. My point is proven. God will anoint people to offend you, to be mean to you. He has a plan. He has a purpose. What is the plan? What is the purpose? To increase your capacity to be more like Jesus, to increase your capacity to forgive. Well, that was Pharaoh. That's Old Testament, Bishop. What about New Testament? Well, look at this. These are the words of Jesus. Turn to Mark chapter number four. I'm getting ready to help some of you tonight. How about see? Deliverance is happening right now for those of you who will receive this word. Turn to Mark chapter number four. Mark chapter number four. It is most. It's popular for a lot of scenarios, but but for the sake of this discussion, Jesus is talking about how the kingdom works. And he says, the kingdom is like a man who sows seed and some fell by the wayside. Some fell on stony ground and some fell among thorns. And then some fell in good ground. You know, the ones that fell amongst thorns um, uh, took root and began to grow, but the thorns choked them. But the ones that fell on good ground, they produced the harvest, right? So in, in Mark chapter number four, I want to show y'all something. 
that's going to help you with this whole thing of the necessity to forgive. So, you know, they, they say Jesus, you know, uh, you know, he's teaching and they, Jesus, this teaching sounds real good, right? And Jesus is teaching this to other people. He's teaching this to the crowd. So when he's alone with the 12, they're like, you know, Jesus, we were amen. And when you were teaching that and preaching that, you know, we was with you, but we really didn't understand that. So in verse number 10, the Bible says, when he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. He said, I'm speaking the words to them that I'm speaking to you. I'm giving you the meaning. Um, I'm speaking to them in parables because if it is, watch this. Because it is their lot, you know, it, it, it's it, it's their destiny at this point in their lives. Because I believe that people can get it later. But he said, these are my enemies, right? The, these are the people that are going to say crucify him. He says, so that they may be ever seen, but never perceived. That they might see with their eyes, but not see with their spiritual eyes. That they might hear with their natural ears, but not hear with their spiritual ears. Why? Because if they understood this, they might turn and be forgiven. This is heavy. He says, there are people who have been anointed to be offensive to you that I harden their hearts like I did Pharaoh's or I keep them from seeing it. So you trying to figure out why they can't see that what they're doing is offensive. Maybe they're the person or the people that God has anointed to offend you. And the Bible tells me, you know, that, 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 uh, that, that even when we're faithless, Jesus is faithful because he can't deny himself, which means whatever, whatever the decision is that, God's make, that God makes, he can't go back on it. He can't repent on it. And it would stand a reason to me that if God would anoint Pharaoh to be offensive, to be mean to, to be uh, resistant of the ministry of Moses, watch this, and, and continue to take it out on the Israelites who were in bondage, God does the same thing today. All right, Bishop, that ain't enough. Write this down. The Lord said something to me today that blew me out of the water. He said, Kevin, tell the people that in order to be able to forgive in the way that I want them to forgive, because forgiveness is the greatest expression of love, they must be aware of this term. I ain't never heard the term before. It's the term that God gave me. So I'm gonna give it to you. And the term is this. You must be aware of the reality of justifiable offense. So I asked the Holy Ghost, I said, what do you mean justifiable offense? Because it would seem that just by just by the etymology or the nature of the words that at some point it is it is uh, permissive uh, or you have reason and the right to offend somebody. He says, "Well, okay, you know, Jesus is a rock of offense." Because I you know, I go through the stuff with the Holy Ghost. I I argue with God a lot. 
I really do. I, I do. Argue not like I just I want to, you know, so I got I ask questions. Like I said, what oh, this is that that and so you know, it's called dialectic reasoning. That's what it's called. The dialectic reasoning is simply this. It is uh uh a a consistent and continuous exchange of yes and no's till you only get to a yes, right? Right. Teachers know what that, that's what dia, dialectic reasoning is, you know. Um good teachers do, you know, they, they do that. They take this whole thing. No, well, that two plus three can't be can't be six because da 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 da. And then you just go in and you explain the equations and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, that might have been a bad example, but you teachers know that. He said, that's not what I'm talking about, Kevin. He said, I'm not talking about offending people for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the gospel, standing on truth. He said, when you talk about justifiable offense, there are people who, because their minds are blinded, watch this, because their minds are blinded and their hearts are hardened by me, who, who will, who will justify offending you. I said, okay, God, you gotta, you gotta take me a little, you, you gotta take me a little further than that. He says, okay, I will. He says, you might need to write this down. You might need to write this down. He gave me a couple of scenarios. He said to me, first of all, Kevin, you got to realize this. That the kind of forgiveness that I'm talking about is not a forgiveness that should be dependent upon an admission of wrong. I said, but Lord, you told me in Luke 21 or Luke 17, I'm sorry, that offenses must come and you pronounce a woe on the ones who, who, who offend your little ones. And then you tell me uh, that I need to take heed to myself so that if anyone sins against me, I should rebuke them or confront them. And if they repent, I forgive them. And then you said, if they, if they offend me seven times and uh, um, um, seven times repent, I should forgive them. I said, Lord, so, so you've just told me, at least I think, that if I confront them and they don't admit it, then I got the right to hold on to it. He said, that's not what I mean. I said, so what do you mean, Holy Spirit? He says, if you confront them and they don't admit it or they don't apologize for it, when you say it, he said, let it go. Let it go. Like, don't try to prove to them that they are in error. I said, okay, I've been through that before. I get it. Dr. Davis, good to see you. I can accept that. But then he hit me with something else. He said, the other, the other aspect of justifiable offense in the mind of the offender is this, and it's two prone. Number one, they don't consider it offensive if you don't react with pain or with um, disgust. I said, what do you mean? He said, um, Because you let it go, they're convinced that it ain't wrong. But just because you let an offense go, it does not mean that the offense is not wrong. I said, all right, Holy Ghost, you got to show me this. So he takes me to the table at the Last Supper. And I want you to see this in writing. And I'm done.
So John chapter number 13, turn there very quickly. John chapter number 13, and I'm done, y'all. You still got time to log on. You still got time to log on. John chapter number 13. Somebody hashtag, this is heavy. John chapter number 13, I'll begin reading at verse number one. I'm going to read very fast and I'm going to let y'all go. John 13, verse number one. Y'all got it? John 13, verse number one. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Ooh, I can unpack that. Verse number two, the evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the mill, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, including Judas, drying them with towel and that was wrapped around him. I added parenthetically, including Judas in there. Verse number six. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Verse number eight, no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you can have no part with me. Then the Lord, uh, then the Lord, Simon, then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hand and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. He knew it. And that was why he said not every one of you was clean. Verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and uh, returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them, you call, you, oh, he asked them, he said, you call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I am your Lord and your teacher have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet in the same way I washed yours in the same spirit, knowing that one of you was going to betray me. I've set this example for you that you should do as I've done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, no messenger greater than the one who has sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. If you forgive your betrayer, if you wash your betrayer's feet, you will be blessed only if you do it. Verse number 18, I ain't referring to all of you. I know that, know those, those that I've chosen, but this is to fulfill the passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I am telling you now uh, before it happens so that when it happens, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts one, I said. Uh, uh, I sinned, accepts me, and whoever accepts me, accepts the one who sent me. After this, uh, Jesus said uh, he was very troubled in his spirit. Very truly, I say to you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples start, stared at one another to know which one of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to the disciple and asked him, uh, said, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he said, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it's the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, a son of Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him. So Jesus said to him, whatever you do, do quickly. There's another passage. I'm closing right now. Uh, where Y'all know it. That Jesus says, when are you going to betray me? And everybody says, Lord, is it I? And the last one who said, Lord, is it I, was Judas Iscariot. Let me show y'all this so you can show... so. So, so you can see it in writing.
Matthew chapter 26. You still got time to log off. Matthew 26. I started verse 23 because we got to get up. Same, same scenario. The Bible says, Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, you've said so. John 13, 2 says that Satan had, had already persuaded Judas to betray Jesus. When we get to Matthew chapter 26, they sitting around the table. Judas knows that what he did, Judas knows, yet he says, Lord, is it I? He got the Steve Urkel spirit. Did I do that? And you have, let, let me tell you this justifiable offense is not only it does not only happen when your reaction is not is not fueled by pain fueled by disappointment fueled by disgust right like they're gauging you so they say if, if it don't bother him then that means you know he ain't offended or she ain't offended because he or she is not offended does not mean that it is not a, an offense in God's sight. Here's the other thing. I'm trying to help y'all get free. Because justifiable offense says this. In the mind of the person, I know that I'm wrong. But if I tell you what I'm going to do, then I've already told you. So it's like it, it's what it's it's, it's what what's called um, karmic retribution. Karmic ret retribution. We're gonna quote, and here's what I mean. It, it it happens. It happens in in life all the time. So if I sell you, and I'm just using, if I sell you uh, a rotten banana, if it's defective, like, so if it don't look rotten, but I know on the inside there's bacteria and all that kind of stuff. And if I tell you that if I sell you this banana, knowing that it's defiled, knowing that it's mutated, knowing that it has bacteria, knowing that it has germ, knowing that it will make you sick. If I, if I sell it to you, but don't tell you that it will make you sick, then I'm wrong for that. But if I give you this same banana and I tell you, I know that it is, you know, I know that it looks perfectly ripe on the outside. I know, you know, that it is, I know, you know, I know, I know that uh, it looks edible, but I'm going to tell you, this banana has has bacteria causing disease in it. And you take the banana and eat it anyway. Karmic retribution says, I am not responsible because I told you, even though I know it's wrong. Here it is. Justifiable offense says this. I relieve my conscience by telling you that I'm doing what you know is offensive. So God will harden Pharaoh's heart. When you get a chance, you know, it's in Acts chapter number one, but it's also in, it's all, it's, you know, it's also in the songs, uh, Peter, Peter quotes it. Where he says, as it relates to Judas, it was prophesied that Judas would do this. So listen, for those of you who are going through this, this dark dilemma, because it's dark, 
it's dark. It creates a dark season in the soul. And part of your pain comes from the fact that you didn't think that they would do that. They can't see. Because it's about you be made more like Jesus. So man up, woman up, put your big boy, put your big girl panties on. I know, you know, big boy draws, big girl panties. I know it hurts. I know. Offense is supposed to hurt. But you don't, friendship with the world is enmity with God. So you don't handle it the way that people who don't have the spirit of God or who have the spirit of God, but don't yield to the spirit of God, handle it. You handle it the way Jesus prescribed, the way God prescribes. I love you. I know I got a little riled up. But listen, the Holy Spirit empowers you to forgive. And I know I'm a little ahead of myself. But that same Holy Spirit that the 11 received in Luke, I mean, in John 20, is the same Holy Spirit that the other 109 received and, and the hundred and look and the 11 received a second infilling. And the Bible says suddenly there came the sound as of a mighty rushing wind and it filled the whole room where it was, I'm telling you. You don't even need a season of suddenly. You just need a day of suddenly. And there's getting ready to be a sudden shift. It's a it's a quarterly moment. It's a quarterly moment, divinely timed moment. That there's going to be a sudden shift, but only if you yield to the Holy Spirit. Love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use and persecute you. That you might be your father in heaven's children. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Get your ego under control. Move your ego out of the way. Stop trying to correct narratives about you. I'm glad to hear Eugene, Eugenia Pearson. All of us, all of us, all of us. Be compassionate. <laughs> That's a good one, uh, Minister Tam. The, 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 Bible, the Bible says, I need you to read this. Maybe after the Bible says, if they had known what they were doing, they would have never crucified Jesus. They would have never done it. That's why Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. We talked about that last Sunday. Compassion. You should be feeling bad. You should be feeling bad for them. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. You should even be feeling bad for those who in their minds are justified in the offense. They know what they're doing, but they don't know what they're doing. That's what, that's what you said. Like they know, they, listen, they, they know, but they don't know the extent 
of the consequences. Thank you for that inspiration, Eugenia Pierce. And listen, let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, we can't yield to your Holy Spirit without the help of your Holy Spirit. Your word declares in Romans chapter number eight, verse number 26, that the Spirit helps us with our weaknesses, helps us with our infirmities. Holy Spirit, help us to yield to you. Help us to yield to the will of the Father. Help us to yield to the way of the Father. Create in us clean hearts, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. Dig deep beneath the surface and find, God, any seed, any presence of unforgiveness. Any root of bitterness, bitterness that might spring up and defile others. We yield to you tonight. And we honor you. Bless your people in Jesus' name. This is a pivotal night. For those of you who hung out, this is a pivotal night. I say this not as a braggart. I say this, I say this in all humility. This teaching is the one. This teaching is the one. Let everybody else talk about whatever they want to talk about. If I'm not an apostle to anybody else, I'm an apostle to you. If you connected to me, if you ain't, you ain't got to claim it. But I'm speaking, I'm speaking revelation that God has given me for those that he has assigned me to. And tonight, this is the teaching. That if you accept it, embrace it, apply it, it's going to shift you into a dimension of divine orderliness and divine order. If you reject it, at best, you will stay where you are. I love you. Will you please sow tonight? Tonight is a great night to sow. Tonight is a great night to sow. Tonight is a great night for, for those of you who can Somebody on tonight can sow a seed of $500. I'm saying it because the Lord laid it on my heart. And it's, it's more than one. And I'm, I ain't doing this for me. I'm telling you. The, the church is always, always going to take money to do ministry. I'm not trying to manipulate you. Tonight, there are those of you who can sow a seed of 500. There are those of you who can sow a seed of 100. There are those of you who can sow whatever. Some of you can sow more bountifully than you ever but. You sow in agreement. You ain't buying a blessing. You're sowing because, as Paul says, spiritual things have been ministered to you. Natural things ought to be ministered back to us. But Paul wasn't, Paul wasn't buying Bentleys and Paul wasn't buying, uh, you know, jets. And ain't nothing wrong with that. You know, he, wasn't buying, he wasn't buying palatial power. The money that Paul was collecting was for the work of the ministry. And I choose at this point not I, I don't, the seed ain't coming to me. This is the one. It ain't supposed to be easy. You're not supposed to be feeling good right now. The flesh is at war with the spirit. That's what John, James says before. And the spirit is at war with the flesh. And both of them want to win. God bless you, mother. Thank you all. Thank you all for for the compliments, but God gets all the glory. I ain't got sense enough to say this. And I don't think within of myself, I ain't bold enough to say it. But I'm telling you, this is the one. Thank you, Anita Sanders Howard. I appreciate you. Thank you for sowing. Thank you for sowing, Prophetess Geiger. I'm getting ready to go, but I'm telling y'all, this is the one. And I ain't just talking to you, I'm talking to me. Jesus says, and there will, there will come a time that the proverb that is spoken in Israel will be said to me, physician, heal thyself.
they know they wrong. So they know they only telling half the story. So they know I reacted to something they did. So repent for reacting and forgive. Father, dismiss us from this live and never from your presence. Bless your people. In Jesus' name, join us for 6 a.m. prayer in the morning. Sorry for keeping you so long. I love you, but the Holy Ghost is speaking. The Holy Ghost has spoken. And here's the last warning. For many of you, the fire is going to be turned up seven times harder. But the Holy Spirit, whose ministry, we will talk about this next week maybe, his ministry is to bring all things to your remembrance. Don't react. Don't overreact. Don't even act. Thank you, Andrew Pollard. Love you, man. Nay Robinson, God bless you. Just yield to the Holy Spirit. Trust him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean to your own understanding, but in all of your ways, acknowledge him. He's going to direct your path. Wherever you are, whatever you're going through, I don't care how hot the fire is. I don't care. I don't care how much, how much they turn it up. I don't care. I don't care who does not admit, who does not apologize. I don't care. Trust in the Lord with all of y'all and don't lean to your own understanding. But wherever you are and whatever you're going through, acknowledge him. He's going to tell you what to do. And he will never tell you to plot somebody's downfall, to take revenge on anybody. God is trying to make you more like him. I love you, family. Tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., join us for prayer. Take care.